Oh, sorry. Hello. Uh, I think we should start, otherwise we will be stuck here all the night, which will not be good. And uh, this is the last session, but it's still a very important session. It's particularly as it's about Islam. And I'm happy I can introduce the main speaker, who is uh, Professor Farad Koros Hakar from Iranian sociologist and French sociologist. He's coming from a cold desoted Etude on Science Social in Paris. And he will give us a presentation on Sunni and Shia Islam. Please, you can come here. Farad. You have to come here in order to... Yeah, yeah, you have to come here. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to thank first and foremost Professor Cipriani, who is close to me, uh, who has followed very closely what I was doing and then uh, gave me counsels. And I think that he has done a great job so far as I am concerned. And of course, uh, my friend uh, Enzo Pace, whom I know since, I don't know, ages, uh, and uh, uh, have published with him or under his direction, few articles. <clears throat> At any rate, I'm going to pro present to you a, an article <clears throat> on the relationship between Shiism and Sunnism. Uh, of course, I cannot <clears throat> uh, go deeply into the history of both because then it would take a long time and I'm not competent <clears throat> to do it. Uh, so my attempt is at understanding what's going on uh, for the half, for the last half a century in relationships between Shiism and Sunnism. I have a three-point article. Uh, the first is that during the last half a century, the relationship between Shi'is and Sunnis has been <clears throat> more and more antagonized, at least in the major <clears throat> Muslim societies where more than 80% of the Shi'is live. That means in four or five countries. So <clears throat> increase in the antagonistic relationship between Shi'is and <clears throat> Sunnis in those countries, be it Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, and few others. The second point I would like to make is that sociologists have done a lot of work on secularization in Muslim countries, and the result is unequivocally at least following the normal parameters of secularization, that Muslim countries are getting secularized uh, and that uh, even in those countries where the relationship between Sunnis and Shiites are worsening, this secularization process is on the move. The third point is, uh, what I call a paradox, paradox of secularization. That means religion becomes less important in <clears throat> social life, <clears throat> in uh, daily relationships between people. At the same time, <clears throat> this antagonistic relationship between <clears throat> Sunnis and Shiites that becomes a kind of enigma. Why? If religion, <clears throat> is losing its stamina, at least in terms of <coughs> secularization, why this kind of relationship based on Muslim, on Shiites and Sunnis being at loggerhead, you know, uh, in the last 50 years. My solution is, of course, <coughs> partially that of sociologists, but I introduce <coughs> Another aspect to it, uh, 
and it is Muslim theologies, Muslim modern theologies, <clears throat> particularly Sunni and Shiite in the last half a century, and particularly <clears throat> the polarizing or antagonistic <clears throat> theologies. On the one hand, <clears throat> the jihadist theology or theologies. On the other hand, the reformist theologies. I've been working on that for a long time, and <clears throat> I published a book in French uh, last year <clears throat> on a comparison between uh, Christian theologies and Muslim theologies in the last half a century. Uh, <clears throat> and my guess is that <clears throat> there are parallels, but at the same time, there are major differences. So my point by studying the <clears throat> Muslim theologies in this article, in my expose, <clears throat> uh, between Sunnis and Shiites, is to stress the fact that theologies, <clears throat> in their own fashion, reflect secularization in a major way. Jihadist theologies are rather well known in the West. I've been working on that very much. I published, and then many other scholars have done it. But reformist theologies are much less known, and particularly the <clears throat> new ones. Uh, I published with my former students in English <clears throat> articles on the reformist theologies, particularly Shiite ones, but also Sunnis in order to show that there is a tendency within these two subsets of <coughs> Muslim <coughs> religions, that means Shiites and Sunnis, there's a subset <coughs> based on reformism in which <coughs> the <coughs> differences between Shiism and Sunnism are in a way put into question, and the convergence between them has become very important. So, uh, my way of solving this paradox is that uh, antagonistic views of Shiism and Sunnism are based on two major factors. First, politics and authoritarian governments who use it, instrumentalize it, in order to find some kind of legitimacy. And second, active extremist minorities. They are minorities, but their effectiveness is increased by the fact that authoritarian government do not let civil societies to express themselves adequately. Uh, of course, reality is more complicated, and I am not able to <clears throat> develop it here uh, <clears throat> extensively. Uh, but this, to me, shows that <clears throat> there are convergences between the secularization of religion <clears throat> in Christianity, but at the same time, major divergences <clears throat> with Islam, so that in order to understand that, we have to take into account both convergence and divergence and their articulation. That's my point. Now, I try to substantiate what I've been saying, you know, in those three dimensions. Yeah, in order to show that there has been, uh, in a way, secularization and antagonism at the same time. I just read a few <coughs> results of the statistics. According to the 2009 estimates of the Pew Research Center, most Shias, 68 to 80 percent, live in four countries, Iran, <coughs> Pakistan, India, and Iraq. 
And of course, you have minorities in Azerbaijan, Bahrain, uh, Iraq, and so on, and in some African countries as well. But major part of the Shias in the world live in four or five countries. Now, you have also Shias in Turkey, but most of them are <coughs> specific kind of Shias or Alevis. And then you have in Syria, who are also specific kinds of Shias. <coughs> and Alevis were not recognized <coughs> by major <coughs> uh, Shiite societies and <coughs> religious leaders as being genuine Shias up to a few decades ago. They were, you know, stigmatized as being uh, <clears throat> deviant, non-genius, inauthentic Shias, and so on. And <clears throat> since the rapprochement between Iran and Syria, there have been attempts at characterizing them as Shias. And this is, again, <clears throat> the effect that shows the prominence of politics in this phenomenon. Since the 20th century, three major periods can be distinguished in the relations between Sunnis and Shiites in Middle Eastern societies, notably in Saudi Arabia, where between 10 and 15 percent of the population are Shiites, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon and Syria. In these countries, there are large Sunni and Shiite populations. At least 10% of the population is Shiite, as in, <coughs> in <coughs> Saudi Arabia, or Sunnis, as in Iran. And <coughs> what characterizes the relationship between them is that in those countries where Shias are the majority, the repression by the government of the Sunnis is somehow the rule. Saudi Arabia, for instance, Afghanistan. <clears throat> and in, in those countries where Sunnis are the majority, <clears throat> they deal with the Shias, I mean, in the same way as Shias deal with Sunnis, you know, <clears throat> in those respective countries. In Iran, for instance, in which more than 80% of the population is <clears throat> made of Shias, <clears throat> they repress Sunnis. To give you a minor example of this intolerance, <clears throat> you don't find a decent Sunni mosque in Tehran, where more than half a million Sunnis live. <clears throat> in <clears throat> Other Shia countries, in Iraq, we see that the intolerance towards the Sunnis after the American interventions has been very strong, much in the same way as when the Saddam Hussein government ruled the country, that means the Sunni minority, but who <clears throat> ruled Iraq, Intolerance towards the Shiites was the rule. So there is a major problem. Why this sort of intolerance? How to understand it? You know, because uh, in a way, of course, uh, I would say uh, authoritarian governments uh, use this divide uh, in order to rule and find some kind of justification for their authoritarian, <clears throat> you know, attitudes. But this explanation is, of course, <clears throat> not the only one. There are many others uh, that should be combined with it. <clears throat> and my second point is that because of globalization, 
humiliation, particularly, for instance, humiliation among the Muslim countries <clears throat> due to the Palestinian question and other questions <clears throat> related to that, uh, there's a tendency to find a scapegoat. Scapegoatism is very important in this intolerance. You know, when you are in a Shiite country, by scapegoating Sunnis, <coughs> you give a kind of reasonable, and their quote, <coughs> ground for the ills of the society. The same holds true in uh, <coughs> uh, the countries where the majority is the opposite. So that scapegoating of minorities is a very important phenomenon, but in its modern way, because we know that, I mean, a French scholar, I mean, René Girard worked on scapegoatism in a kind of philosophical, social, I mean, philosophical, I would say, theological perspective or literary perspective, but scapegoatism in, sociology has specific features that distinguish it from the philosophical or theological one and has to be dealt with. I try to do it in my, myself <clears throat> in a way, but my guess is that it needs much more scholarly work. So one reason of this intolerance is scapegoatism. The other is authoritarian governments. The third is the <clears throat> Uh, activists, uh, extremist minorities. They need, in a way, uh, a kind of enemy to justify their <coughs> radical attitude. In jihadism, we have many <coughs> questions raised by this attitude, intolerance, major violence, dehumanization, and of course, <coughs> killing and maiming uh, uh, as a <coughs> the only way to deal with this phenomenon. So, <coughs> you see that the problem arises as to how to explain what can be called secularization and what is the result of it, which is a counterintuitive result in the case of the Muslim countries in regard to the relationship between Sunnis and Muslims. And not only Sunnis and Muslims, but Sunnis and Christian minorities, for instance, the Opt in Egypt, who have been mistreated, you know, much more than half a century ago, and which has resulted in the migration of most of the Christians in the Muslim world to other parts of the world. You know, Christians were minorities in many Muslim countries, and now they are almost disappearing. In Iraq, for instance, their number is, has dwindled to a few thousands, so far as I know, in many other countries as well. So, this intolerance is antagonistic in a way to the secularization theory at least in its major trends. That means secularization <coughs> means uh, the lessening of the significance of religion in daily life among people and so on. And <coughs> secularization has been <coughs> in a way substantiated by statistics and other means <coughs> in uh, many Muslim countries and the most recent results <coughs> were available, I think, a year ago um, by a scholar, American 
Iranian scholar uh, uh, in one of the major universities in the US. And in my article, of course, <clears throat> I give full details about this article and some others. Uh, <clears throat> and so I give you <clears throat> an example. And I quote, between 2011 and 2020, the percentage of Egyptians supporting the separation of religion and politics increased from 56 to 81 percent. And Turkish respondents from 76 to 79 percent. Iraqis scored a rise from 54 to 69 percent in the main survey period of 2004-2011. This figure rising to 80% by 2018, according to additional data. While in Lebanon, the figure went up from 75% to 80% in the 2008-2011 period. The percent of Saudis who thought it was very important for government to implement only the Sharia, Islamic law, dropped from 73 to 31% in the 2003-2011 period. And only 7% strongly agreed that democracy was incompatible with Islam. It can be argued that Saudis would have been bolder in expressing support for secular politics if the kingdom had allowed a more open political environment. There has been an increase among Middle Easterners who think that religious leaders should not interfere in politics from 62% to 78% in Egypt and 75 to 80% in Turkey between 2011 and 2020. Iraqis also show, saw a sharp rise in this sentiment with percentages increasing from 52 to 67% between 2004 and 2011. Now, in the case of Iran, it is even more accentuated. More than 70% of the society has adopted secularized mores and demands that the constraint in the name of religion be loosened on the society. I quote this article. The protest movement of September 2022 and its slogans against theocracy and the Shiite clergy shows this in many respects. What prevents secularization from exerting a corresponding influence in Muslim societies is the permanence of authoritarian, even despotic and sometimes totalitarian states. These block the evolution of society towards a political openness that could be translated at the religious level, in particular, by a more peaceful relationship between the Shiites and Sunnis. <clears throat> if we take the example of authoritarian governments in Shiite and Sunni countries, Iran and Afghanistan, for instance, the government becomes the major instance of imposing Sharia and repression in its name in a society and exercises its dominance almost independently of the overall evolution of the society. In this case, the government makes an alliance with a fundamentalist minority in society in order to gain <coughs> legitimacy in their eyes. The undemocratic, even anti-democratic state needs these groups to maintain its power. That is what we call the neo-fundamentalist tendency, not only in Sunni societies, but also in Shiite ones. So, in many respects, what I try to suggest comes down to three major factors. First, authoritarian or totalitarian governments, second, uh, fundamentalist or uh, extremist minorities who become entangled 
in a kind of vicious relationship with the government. And third, scapegoating. Now, women become a stake in this relationship. Almost everywhere in the Muslim world, we are witnessing a secularization that finds one of its major actors in women. They demand to be recognized as social actors in their own right in society in rupture with the Sharia. Of course, by doing this, <clears throat> either they can claim democracy explicitly in their demand, or sometimes they propose a new understanding of Islam based on equality, gender equality between men and women. So we kind of feminist theology, feminist Islamic theology. And we have few cases of that. Of course, the demand for social recognition of women goes back to the end of the 19th century for Egypt, Turkey, and Iran, but is found in a massive way almost everywhere in the Muslim world after the access of women to education, school, then university, and their increasingly tense relationship with neo-fundamentalist minority groups in Muslim societies. <clears throat> this trend can be seen in Iran, but also to a lesser degree in Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> the Saudi state, while retaining its undemocratic and repressive character, especially towards Shiites, is loosening the constraints on the women who have more room to maneuver than in the past. They can now drive and even take off the veil without incurring legal sanctions. But women are demanding to be recognized as full citizens in most of the Muslim societies without being organized and without being able to make their voices adequately heard in civil society. <clears throat> so that the gender relation is at the heart of this secularization process. And <clears throat> we have to work on that to show its influence. In the West, secularization had, of course, a gender aspect, but it was probably not as important as it is in the Muslim world nowadays. Major trends of secularization in the West occurred either without women or not with women as, I would say, major social actors. Of course, this can be contested, but that's my personal view. But in the Muslim world nowadays, secularization goes hand in hand with women. In Iran, the, the latest social movement was launched by women at the beginning, September 2022. <clears throat> and in my latest book, which was published a month ago, less than a month ago, about two weeks ago, on this social movement, <clears throat> I try to show how women became really major social actors. And that's the first time in the Muslim world that in a massive way, women become <clears throat> the avant-garde of a social movement. Before that, they participated in Iran, in Egypt, in many other Muslim countries to the movements, to the protest movements, but now, for the first time in this movement, they were the leaders at the beginning. They took the initiative. They launched the movement. And they did it not against Islam, but against the imposed veil, against a veil <coughs> that was <coughs> imposed on women in the name of a theocratic view of Islam. And many women who wear the veil participated in this movement to denounce the forced imposed veil. So it's not 
women without veil against women with veil. Many cases of women strictly veiled who supported this movement have been <coughs> counted, and many of them have been put in jail. So that it is not the veil, it's the fact that it's imposed. So the secularization in the Muslim world, you know, <coughs> has two major aspects in terms of freedom. On the one side, what might be called classically political freedom, freedom to be citizens. And in that respect, women and men <clears throat> have been in unison, have been in agreement. But there is another aspect of freedom, the existential access, the freedom of the body, the freedom I called joie de vivre in French. The word, you know, the expression has passed into English as well. So joie de vivre means what it means. That means expressing existential <clears throat> aspects of your aspirations without the government or any other instance interfering with it. And this existential aspect of freedom is intertwined very closely with the political one. And in that respect too, I think secularization has its own peculiar feature in the world of Islam compared to the Christian world. Because in the Christian world, they did not have to defend the right to wear or not to wear the veil and of course, there is a culture, uh, the Christian culture is probably in that respect less strict, more open than the orthodox or theocratic Islam. At any rate, women have become one of the major focal points of secularization in the Muslim world, and the demand for <clears throat> existential freedom, bodily freedom, body becomes, you know, a major <clears throat> focal point. And in France, for instance, a philosopher like Merleau-Ponty or Michel Henry, and many phenomeno phenomenologists in Europe have worked on that, but from a strictly philosophical point of view. Here we can add anthropological and sociological <coughs> viewpoints based on what might be called a new kind of secularization theory, which takes into account these dimensions. So, I can extensively talk about that, but I think my time is, of course, measured, uh, rightly speaking, otherwise we will all fall asleep. I would like to stress a few basic points about this reformist theology in Shiism and in Sunnism. I think it's very important to show how these theologies are the expression, the manifestation of secularization at the same time in the name of a kind of absolute discourse on God, they contribute to it in a certain fashion. I'm focusing so far as the Shiites are concerned about the new generation, because uh, the older generation, Suru, Shabastari, and so on, they are somehow known in the theological circles and philosophical circles in the West, but not the new ones. I take the case of a theologian who is rather young, in his late 40s, 
آرش نراقی and that's another feature of most of the theologians in order to develop their ideas they have been forced to leave iran in the last 20 years because it's impossible to publish <coughs> freely in iran these ideas so most of them are in the west in the us in canada in germany few in france <clears throat> and of course their relationship with iranian society are very close because most of what they publish is in persian and put on the internet on the web and arash narari is one of them <clears throat> who has been working on islam For him, the Quran is not primarily a legal book. That means promulgation of law. But one of moral and spiritual guidance. Hidayat in Persian. And of course in him. Uh, mysticism, uh, Sufi mysticism. And therefore does not have the coercive character attributed to it by the traditionalists and supporters of Islamic theocracy. Secondly, sorry, I have, it jumps. Well, technology doesn't follow me, even in theology. <coughs> the historical sources of the Quran and its interpretations must be subjected to criticism. You know, what he says is important because uh, to Impose criticism on the Quran nowadays is not very easy. You know, sometimes the result is your death. Finally, in order to understand the Quranic commandments, one must not lose sight of their historicity so that the Quran has been looked at from historical perspective. This too is in contradiction with what might be called traditionalist view of Islam which denies historicity to the Quran. Since it's a word of God, it's beyond history. So you have to apply Islamic rules, you know, independently of the historical setting. Cut off heads, cut off <clears throat> arms, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, He proposes literalist interpretation in this case do not provide a satisfactory solution to the problem of human <clears throat> destiny. So uh, I'm not going to focus on it. In the article, of course, I develop it much more, but <clears throat> let's say that for him there is a reading of the Quran, understanding of a Quran that in a way integrates many aspects of Christian hermeneutics. You know, he has read Christian hermeneutics. And so not only Christian, when you talk about Hans Georg Gadamer, Gadamer is partially Christian, partially, you know, Greek, disciple of Heidegger. <clears throat> But he knows Christian theo theologians. And I think that's important because there is an influence of Christianity on these Muslim reformers that is, thank you, partially recognized partially covered, you know, they cannot claim that what they say is based on their readings of Christian theologians or philosophers. But at the same time, they do not hide it. At any rate, it's a new type of religious dialogue between Christianity and Islam that is not dealt with in our, you know, 
I would say, conferences uh, in an explicit manner without denying, not letting it be said so that you are influenced, but you don't recognize fully this influence and so on. It's a kind of ambiguity which is consubstantial, as philosophers would say, to the nature of the discourse. <clears throat> and before ending, because of course my time is finishing, I would like to quote at least one last one. In the article I quote around 10, but now I reduce it to two because of course, uh, 45 minutes is a lot. Uh, I would like to talk about another theologian, Abul Ghassim Fanoi. He is two, in his late 40s. And he lives in the West. And so what he says is that, I summarize it, uh, by distorting it a bit, a bit. <clears throat> he says, we should not talk of the prophet as if we talked of him. We should talk of the prophet as if we were talking to him. And those, <clears throat> so that I and two become very important. Those who have read Martin Buber, you know, are aware of this kind of dialogue, you know, talking to rather than talking of. So that the second person becomes God or the prophet rather than a third person. God as he or she, as you like. But God is you. Thou, in Old English. And he tries to develop this idea by partially getting influence by some other, you know, theologians. My guess is that he knows Ricoeur. Ricoeur is a French Protestant theologian who has been working on these issues. I'm not sure. Still, this type of discourse is, to my mind, undeniably influenced by Christianity. And it shows that a new type of dialogue between Christianity and Islam is possible through these theologians. So, summarizing it, the new theologies in Sunnism and Shiism show that a new type of secularization is occurring in which the difference between Shiism and Sunnism is downgraded to almost nothing, and they say it explicitly. And in a way, I would say, they claim that there is a kind of mutual understanding between monotheistic religions, that means Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, that should be taken into account. So that we see within Islam, in its reformist theology, a kind of new picture of the self and the other. And in this new picture, we see, I would say, a kind of secularization that has its own rationale. rationale which is different from secularization as sociologists understand it, you know, as being <laughs> impersonal factors, which are very important. Uh, separation of the public and uh, private sphere, religion <clears throat> being, I mean, uh, circumscribed to the private sphere, <clears throat> uh, uh, lessening of the importance of the sacred in uh, social life and so on. Thank you for your listening to me.
questions. So thank you very much for this nice overview. And now we have two respondents. The first one is Professor Vicenzo Pace, Professor Emeritus, University of Padova, one of the main pillars of the sociology of religion in the world. Please, okay. answer. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Farad. I will try to sum up uh, some questions concerning the, this uh, very interesting report by Farad. The first concern, of course, the, the one of the core arguments presented in his paper, and it concerns precisely the, how to say, the resurgent conflict between Shia and Sunni. Uh, a new Fitna al Kubra. Historically, the, this division uh, pertains to the, the origin of Islam, is the first community divided around the problem of succession of the charisma of the prophet, uh, we know. But my first question is when? Because through the analysis of when, perhaps we could understand much better the extension of this conflict we are now, uh, we are living. It's not at the end of the conflict, we are at the, at the core of the conflict. And my suggestion is my first question to uh, Farad. If perhaps we could accept uh, the year uh, 1979, as a sort of turning point, a sort of clash of civilization within Islam. It's an infra-conflict. And we remind what's happening. In, I, I select only four uh, events. First of all, the so-called uh, Iranian Revolution that at the end has been hegemonized by uh, a representative of the cleric establishment, Ayatollah uh, Ruola Khomeini, uh, who invented, invented uh, how, how to say, a sort of model of Islamic State uh, interpreting a peculiar tradition modern peculiar tradition within the uh, Shia theology that the governance, the governance of the city, the police, uh, has been uh, seconded by the principle of Velayat al faqh the, the supremacy of the jurisprudence, religious jurisprudence, why? Because in the Shia, in the religious imaginary of the Shia, uh, we are living in a transitional period of history, of redemption, of salvation. We are waiting for the savior, Al Mahdi, at the end of time, when the hidden Imam will reappear, but the reapparition of the hidden imam coincides with the end of time. So in this idea, it is a eschatological idea, the legitimation that the religious cleric, religious interpreter, the ayatullah, are able to govern at the best way this eschatological transition. In this sense, I'm not surprised uh, when I, I watch on TV uh, this exercise of necropolitics. Oh, you, uh, Farad is an expert of this uh, idea of a relationship between death, power, 
martyropathy and I, of course, necropolitics. Who are able to decide to kill people? Only those who are, how to say, have the power, religious power, to interpret this eschatological tension and to prepare the final salvation. At the same time, you, you remember, uh, there was, of course, this very historical uh, turning point, the peace between uh, Egypt and Israel it was the first step, first step up to uh, the recent uh, Abraham uh, agreement. And you remember that uh, in, uh, in uh, two years later, Anwar al-Sadat was killed by, uh, in a public parade of uh, Egyptian army uh, by an extremist group, Jihad al-Jihad al Islamia. Uh, one of the militants was uh, al-Zawahiri, a young doctor militant in this group. Then you have another very famous event, the entering of uh, Red Army in Istanbul, in Afghanistan, and the story of, of relationship between the uh, Soviet Union has started, uh, and was, this occupation was uh, uh, for 10 years. And then there's another event I, I would like to remind because for me it's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, story. It concerns the attack uh, to Al Majid Al Haram, uh, the great <coughs> mosque in uh, Mecca, by an extremist group, a puritanic group, uh, uh, who contested the modernization, but in our language, or in Trelsh, Trelsh language, the compromise with the world by the Saudi regime, uh, who claim to defend the pure, the pure Islam, but at the same time, they accept any compromise with the political powers with the uh, exploitation of black, black, the, the black uh, oil, uh, 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 the, I'm sorry, the black gold, the black gold, uh, the oil, and then accept to uh, commodify Islam up to now. Islam in, in some area of the, the most, uh, how to say, affluent society in Emirates, Saudi Arabia, is becoming a sort of brand. When you buy a, a halal product, you are buying your personal religious spiritual identity. Because in this product, you, are, you have the guarantee that, of course, this product is a sort of, uh, how to say, recognize that your consciousness is in peace with God. So, in this sense, these four events, of course, is arbitrary. Uh, every time we, we try to, how to say, to focus to set a turning point in history is an arbitrary operation, but from a sociological point of view, it's a, how to, how to say, an intellectual exercise in order to find out if we are agree around a set of words, what does it mean to speak about religion when we speak about this conflict between Shia and, and Sunni, uh, uh, it means uh, the, the, the agreement around a set of concepts, a set of tools of interpretation of the reality. So, is it a, is, is of course, is an example, is one of the most interesting uh, evolution of the Saudi Arabia regime, 
it's the new no it's 10 years ago it was inaugurated the Albaid Habraj Hotel with the Mecca, with the Mecca uh, outlook. You can stay in a comfortable room, this luxury room, and to pray in your room. Uh, it's a comfortable Islam, this. It's not the, the poor Islam in some part of Mauritius, Mauritania or south of Morocco or other part of the world. So if I take seriously uh, religion as a sort of cognitive and emotional map that orient the social action of individual groups and collective movement, I, I, I have to conclude uh, listening to the, the report by Farad that we are, we are analyzing, we are observing not Islam, perhaps it doesn't exist, but we, we are observe the way used by some collective actors to manage a sort of symbolic capital, drawing some elements in order to motivate the action, particularly when you have to uh, overcome some anthropological and psychological frontier to kill other people, to kill other people. In this sense, um, I think we need not only the, the, the uh, communication by Farad is a very, very in-depth analysis of a theological debate, but it's a persistent uh, question in the history, in the long durée of Islam. But I, I think we, we need perhaps a, a, another exercise that has been made by a very important uh, uh, intellectual, uh, Jacob Taubes, when he wrote this uh, seminal book uh, on Western eschatology. I insist on, on the, this term eschatology because it's a sociological term, because it's a sociology of the waiting. We are waiting an appointment. We are waiting the final salvation. We are, and then we mobilize. Of course, converging on uh, some political target, but behind this political target, sometimes there are these eschatological things. We need both for, his, for, for the Islam an analysis like uh, that uh, has been conducted by uh, Jakub Tavos in 1947, just before uh, he was called by Gershon Sholem uh, at the Hebrew University for teaching uh, sociology of religion. For a short period, he was teacher of sociology of religion. It's, it's uh, important to remind. <clears throat> so this is my first uh, uh, reflection. And then my idea uh, uh, is why, Farad, you haven't uh, quoted uh, Indonesia and Malaysia? Because we, we, when we go out the MENA area, Middle East and the North African country, and we look at what's happening in Asia, where Islam is, uh, is an important uh, relevant presence, particularly in Indonesia and in Malaysia. In spite of, uh, also in, in these countries, there are some radical fundamentalist uh, movement. Uh, it, it, the majority of people, uh, how could say, are able to preserve a social framework of the collective memory. It, in the social framework of the collective memory in this country, there's the idea, okay, you are Shia, you are Sunni, you are Christian, you are Buddhist, you, are, you can respect. You can respect each other. In other words, 
my question is, in this area, in this, is possible perhaps to imagine the combination between Asiatic way to democracy with the tolerance in religion and in the civil recognition of the alterity. Why in other countries is not possible? Uh, perhaps uh, we have time to to, uh, to analyze this uh, this problem, but I, I think. Uh, just to, to come back to Saudi Arabia, the 10% of population are Shia. They are living in this, in this eastern part of Saudi Arabia, uh, close to uh, the most important oasis, and then the most important resources from agriculture, and under the house is plenty of oil. In 2011, there was a, a, a sort of Arab Spring in Saudi Arabia too, like in Bahrain, other countries, uh, Qatar and so on, but in Saudi Arabia too, repressed. The, the leader of Shia, uh, Nimr al-Bakir al-Nimri, has been arrested, persecuted, and sentenced by capital debt. And Tehran reacted, saying, okay, three minutes, okay, uh, we could, uh, we, we, don't, we don't forget this uh, homicide, and then, of course, this, uh, this uh, 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 conflict as a, a and as another effect on the antagonistic, antagonistic conflict between uh, Sunni and Shia. Second, the question concern secularization. What does it mean to speak sec about secularization in this country? Uh, just uh, if you, uh, well, we have time, but you, you look at this Arab barometer, Arab is a, you got to pay attention. Uh, it's a, estimation, uh, it's an American institute uh, or research supported by a very good uh, team of uh, researchers coming from Princeton University, Michigan University, the Palestinian Center of Research and so on. Pay attention, but it, in, it the, same, the same data illustrated by Farad has been in this uh, research. Look at, look at this one. No? Uh, okay, but what does it mean in this case in Tunisia? I, I know a little bit more the case of Tunisia and Lebanon. What does it mean to speak about secularization in case of Tunisia or in case of Lebanon? Uh, my, my impression is that uh, this drop, this decline, probably means we would like to liberate themselves from this uh, official political interpretation of, of, of Islam, but it perhaps doesn't, doesn't mean that we can go out the religious experience. You know? Because at the same time, meanwhile you have this uh, data there's an increased number of people attracted by Sufism. There's a new Sufism uh, fashion in, in many countries. And what does it mean, this new, uh, new Sufism? No. Uh, perhaps means I am able to uh, make a religious experience, individualized experience, with more or less respect of the master of the, of the Tarika, of the Turuk, and then I go out of this, uh, how to say in, 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 in Goffman language, sort of totalitarian institutionalization of religion. So just to give another, oh, this, this in Lebanon, up to now, there's a, it started in 2011, a long protest against the idea, ah, 
we are very, uh, how to say, uh, very dis disappointed with this, not only the hegemonic presence of some political religious party, but the, oh, the territorialization, or in Belgian terms, the pillarization of the, of the society. There are some neighborhoods, some, some banks, some hospitals, pillarized, like in, in other countries, we know very well this uh, idea developed by Dobler. So in this sense, my question is, uh, we have to look at this the new, uh, new generation, the younger generation, uh, uh, who, who are able to, uh, how could say, to develop a new social religious imaginary against this manipulation of the religious, uh, the religious power uh, and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. As always, so many interesting questions posed by Enzo Pace. And now the last commentator is from Professor Roberto Ricucci, University of Torino. Please, Roberto. Okay, so it's time maybe to energize the audience because I'm the last speaker of the first day of this international. No, 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 Roberto, look, look at the screen. Look at the screen at the, at the camera. Yes, I'm not so tall. So, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, and, uh, I'm singing up and I'm framing in the camera. So uh, it's, uh, it's good to say this and this way, in this way, I would like to uh, energize uh, the audience and uh, start to uh, uh, have uh, the last 20 minutes slash 30, 30 all together, 30 all together uh, with this, uh, the final discussion about uh, Farad uh, paper and uh, Muslims uh, in general. So uh, thanks so much for the, uh, the paper. It is really uh, interesting. Uh, however, uh, I would like to uh, comment the paper from my peculiar perspective. Okay, okay. Uh, from my uh, peculiar uh, perspective, uh, which is the perspective of a scholar uh, strongly committed to uh, study and investigate uh, Muslims living abroad. Uh, what does it mean living abroad? It means uh, living in uh, countries who are not Muslim uh, country, according to the definition, but uh, where uh, Muslim uh, groups are used to consider uh, minorities. So now I have to see down because I'm not able to uh, read my uh, notes on the laptop. So uh, now we are uh, energized uh, <clears throat> a bit and you can uh, go ahead and listening my uh, uh, notes. So uh, several uh, novelties appears in the Muslim societies and also in the various Muslim communities around the world. And from the perspective of the various Muslim diasporas, I would like to discuss the issue of Islam and uh, of Islam out of Muslim countries in these current uh, times. From the perspective of Islam in those societies where Muslims are part of the religious minorities and are considered the big issue uh, to be coupled with, uh, topics as um, social cohesion, diversity management, religious pluralism, secularization, transnational religious capital, and uh, religious uh, transmission should be mentioned. Indeed, in my right now 15 minutes, I would like to uh, outline to what extent the changes in the Muslim world are under considered in the uh, Uma who lives abroad and uh, far away only geographically, far away from uh, the changes occurring in Muslim uh, countries. And to what extent some stereotypes 
are still alive in non-Muslim uh, countries on uh, Muslims. So this is uh, this could be a kind of a uh, roadmap. Uh, don't worry. I don't want to explain uh, each uh, each stop uh, till the end, but just to have uh, an idea of what you are uh, going to read in the final paper uh, when uh, the book of this conference will be uh, published. But uh, now I would like to uh, organize uh, my comments according uh, uh, according to PS uh, that will be displayed in three different uh, acts. So uh, starting from uh, the first act, uh, let me uh, call it uh, like setting the framework. Muslims uh, end up under uh, observation at every uh, European and worldwide uh, latitude. More than in the United States, uh, in the United States, according to the most recent uh, surveys, not so, not surprisingly, according to the Pew Center, uh, uh, this is uh, what we have to be uh, mentioned. On the other hand, already in 2006, uh, around 15 years uh, ago, the counterintuitive result of a survey uh, carried out by uh, Economist magazine found that Muslims and members of other religious uh, affiliations felt more protected uh, in the US that, rather than in Europe. And rather than in the uh, United Kingdom, an emblematic country of multiculturalism in the old continent, a country where, for instance, uh, London uh, has uh, since a couple of uh, years a mayor uh, with a Muslim uh, background and where several politicians have uh, at the same time a Muslim uh, the ground and the same uh, we can uh, found in uh, France, where uh, several uh, ministries as well as politicians have a uh, Muslim background. Thomas Jefferson wrote that the key test for America's success as a land of freedom and equal dignity for all would be welcoming the followers uh, of Muhammad, at the time considered truly the other. However, these positions are not enough to explain the different attitudes towards Muslims on the two sides of uh, the Atlantic <clears throat> Sea. Migration by, uh, bias, selective reasons for entries, geographical distance, and different ways for, of entering the community of citizens, let me say national, uh, nationalities uh, law, uh, can help to reconstruct the reasons for a more positive attitude towards uh, Muslims in the U.S. And this is, uh, let me uh, conclude with the first uh, issue to be uh, further investigate to what extent the international debate used to split data or findings taking account of the various religious school of reference could, going, could go beyond the main division between Shia and uh, Sunni in the uh, American uh, landscape. This is not uh, really well uh, investigated and we can discuss uh, a bit in another conference, of course. And uh, following this, in which way changes in Muslim countries are used in the media, economic, political debates to display another version of uh, how to speak about uh, Muslims. In Europe, Substantially, in the European Union uh, frameworks, uh, relations with Muslim communities are definitely more complex and various compared with the, uh, the US. Of course, different countries, different uh, local uh, contexts, different uh, historical uh, uh, diversification of the relations with uh, Muslims. Uh, however, one fact appears transversal. The religious traditions that refer to Islam and the ways of life informed by Sharia uh, law are generally represented as not at all in tune with the values, uh, the rights, the freedoms guaranteed uh, by different uh, states. So the uh, case of Muslims is the for a key topic of a difficulty of managing religious minorities. Even more so when uh, these are intertwined with other variables, such as uh, that of human mobility, migration, social class, economic position, and so on and uh, so forth. Being in a lower position or a migrant, a foreigner, at, at the same time, uh, uh, Muslim uh, could be the worst uh, way uh, to be considered. It could be the worst way to be uh, portrayed in, uh, in the media. 
So the next question uh, to the uh, lecturer uh, could be the relations between uh, the European Union and Muslim uh, countries are at the core of the various socioeconomic political agendas. But as scholars, we have to uh, clearly admit the lack of the so-called research policy nexus in trying to update uh, who to how to speak and consider to what extent religious identity interact with other uh, identity traits in European uh, cities, who identify themselves as uh, Muslims, but who are at the same time Germans, uh, French, Austrians, Italians at, uh, at least, and a very uh, few <clears throat> cases. Second, uh, second step, uh, let me know if uh, I'm going too, too quickly or uh, I have more, uh, a couple of minutes. I'm fine, great. So second uh, step, uh, speaking about religious transmissions in uh, turbulent times. Muslim countries, as we heard, are moving towards the secularized uh, stage, while Muslims in the diaspora countries uh, seems to be uh, fixed in the uh, image of the uh, strong uh, active uh, believer. So it is, it is quite uh, <clears throat> uh, um, paradoxically that uh, in the other countries, people used to change uh, the way of interact with their uh, religious identity. But uh, in uh, the migratory countries, uh, people seem to be fixed. Uh, they are strongly adherent to their uh, main religious or their historical or their uh, family uh, religious uh, background. It's quite strange. And maybe uh, it's not true. The relationship with the religious sphere represents still a key element for all the Muslim uh, generations living abroad. Uh, this means, of course, for parents as well as for uh, their children. The latter, uh, the latter group grow up and become adults in a scenario marked by two processes uh, characterized of the youth to which they uh, belong. So Muslim youth belong to, the, uh, to their uh, generational uh, uh, group. So they are youth uh, first and foremost. Then they are Muslims, then they are maybe, uh, uh, whether the, uh, they have a degree, maybe they are uh, professionals and so on and uh, so forth. The way religious belonging and practice are becoming nuanced, uh, less fixed compared with the past. And at the same time, the process of individualization of the faith increases, keeping relevant the figure of the solitary believer from Berger's uh, memory. However, to these dynamics, we could also mention the peculiar effects of social representation that intervene in the lives of young uh, protagonists in terms of their relationship with ethnically uh, connoted, uh, connoted faith environment, as well as in the construction of a personal relationship with the religious uh, environments. In the recent uh, years, there have been many discussions and debates on the role of religion in the uh, life of young people, especially among those who define themselves as Muslims. And again, the discussion on this topic uh, used to overlap with migration. It seems out of discussion. Young Muslims could be only represented by children of immigration in the uh, diaspora uh, countries. It is clear that according to data from the, the from demography to the uh, nationalities data from uh, several identity uh, <clears throat> survey and so on uh, and other uh, data, for instance, it is false and it is only a perception. However, perceptions matter. Let me uh, go uh, quickly to, uh, to, the end, uh, to the end after mention another uh, uh, question. Young Muslims living in Europe <clears throat> are uh, <clears throat> going uh, to uh, share the same cultural change and social moods are uh, their co-peers are in the Muslim countries. But which kind of ties 
and the reciprocal influences we can mention. So we uh, maybe recall what, uh, what occurred during the uh, Arab Spring, or already mentioned by uh, Enzo. So at that time in uh, 2011, several uh, papers, several uh, debates uh, were uh, <clears throat> dedicated to uh, the link between uh, people living in Tunisia or in, in Egypt, uh, Egypt and their uh, connection through the web with other uh, copiers living around uh, the world, uh, children of their uh, diaspora or other kind of uh, peers. Uh, what we can say about this kind of ties right uh, now? We uh, forgot all that uh, debate or we are saying that this kind of ties built on the online environment are not uh, really effective and are not uh, really a way to uh, display uh, a new uh, identity. So let me uh, conclude uh, with the last uh, 10 rows. 10 rows. Ten. The, no, 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 10, ten rows. So uh, the growth of second generation uh, in uh, Europe as well as in other uh, uh, contests and the number of those who become German, Spanish or Italian are uh, two elements that mark a symbolic change and concrete effects within the European uh, scene. A transformation that concerns uh, directly uh, the young and also their relationship with society translates into the dynamics with the religious identities and the wider uh, debate on identity itself and uh, beyond, which strongly links Islam with terrorism and security uh, affairs. The transition to adulthood and into the political uh, arena, as well as in the socio-economic environment, invites uh, scholars and policymakers on the one end, media and administrators on the other, to become aware of, uh, about the uh, fluidity and the many possible variations in terms of religious identities, and to face with a, a young generation expressing new ways of managing their ties with Islam and of identifying them as potential key actors in supporting the development of an update discourse on Islam around the world, and to be useful to open the black box of uh, Islamic uh, changes. It seems that we can uh, remind uh, all of us the mirror effects uh, mentioned by Sayyad. Changes happening in the Muslim world would affect a religious change in other social cultural contexts, and we have to take them into account and to discuss uh, in the next conference. Thanks. But still, if we have energy, there are some, there are a few minutes we can discuss. Farad can respond. I'm opening the floor. Any interest in? No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. If uh, those who who are remote, who listen us, who follow us, if you have any question. Sorry. No, no, no. no, there is no question. Farad, you will not respond now. No, no okay. Yeah, there is no we need. need another, 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> so then we will leave it for book. But there is, yeah, there is a question from the floor. Yeah, please come here. So first, I want to thank Professor Khosro Khavar um, for a fascinating and really important presentation. So thank you, um, as well as, of course, uh, the different respondents. My question, actually, if you allow me, uh, Professor Khosro Khavar, uh, is addressed to, uh, to uh, Roberta, uh, in part because when you mention at the end sort of the youth and saying that it's their youth identity, which is at the top, uh, in terms of Muslim minorities uh, within Europe. Um, I would argue a bit differently. I would say that it depends on which person. It depends on the people and their context. 
and their degree of secularization and also their degree of connection to local uh, community practicing Muslim communities. And to the extent that that exists and it's strong, then maybe their Muslim identity is more important than their youth identity, whatever the ways of interpreting that might be. So I would argue for a little bit nuances uh, when it comes to these, what I call sort of the hierarchies of identities as they exist within each one of us personally, and how we negotiate that uh, in terms of our own sort of individual agency within the society in the context where we are. Thank you. Yes, uh, Patrice, uh, thanks for uh, <clears throat> your question. Uh, in this way, I have uh, the opportunity to use uh, two minutes more. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, of course, we have to take in account uh, a lot of uh, variables, a lot of uh, different fac factors, and uh, one uh, of, uh, of them this deals, of, uh, of course, with uh, the uh, characteristic of the uh, local ethnic uh, religious uh, community, and uh, to what extent these communities are. Uh, <clears throat> prone to uh, develop or to uh, still maintain strong ties uh, with uh, the uh, way of being Muslims as uh, the first generation used to be in, in their own countries uh, because they uh, still uh, perceive uh, the way of being Muslims are uh, it could be displayed in an environment where uh, there is the so-called infrastructure of the, pray, uh, of the prayer where all the environments uh, still speak ab uh, still speak about Muslim and Muslims. Uh, but uh, young people live in, an, uh, in a different uh, context. So uh, they uh, try to uh, develop their own way to uh, display their uh, religious identity. And uh, this uh, could be uh, different according to, uh, to what extent the local policies may be uh, support or uh, uh, or not, uh, for instance, religious pluralism or uh, the uh, involvement in the uh, civic arena of uh, young Muslims in uh, display and uh, speak about their uh, their identities. Um, furthermore, we can uh, also add uh, another variable, uh, taking account another variable like the uh, uh, transnational religious capital uh, and. Uh, uh, ties develop according to different di diasporas in different uh, countries, as well as ties uh, develop with uh, the, uh, uh, the countries where their uh, parents' uh, origin uh, came from, uh, could be uh, could mention. And uh, last but uh, not least, uh, of course, um, the uh, access to the uh, citizen uh, law. This is another uh, crucial uh, factor uh, to be mentioned, and uh, this uh, could be an important cleavage uh, to be uh, reminded to all of us. Okay, well, just just information that Ellen Barker from Lada School of Economics followed this session, and she likes very much your presentation, so I have to say this, and with that, I'm closing this session. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your attention. And see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. We start sharply at 9 o'clock. Thank you. Well done, well done.